So Silvio Larusso is an Italian artist and designer. His ongoing PhD research in design sciences at the EUAV University of Venice is focused on the intersections between publishing and digital technology from the perspective of art and design. He regularly collaborates with the Institute of Network Cultures in Amsterdam. After he received his MA in Visual and Multimedia Communication in 2011, he spent a period of study at the Network Media course of the Piet Zwart Institute in Rotterdam. He took part in exhibitions, festivals and events such as Transmediale in Berlin, Unlike Us in Amsterdam, Fahrenheit 39 in Ravenna, and some of his works are included in the Rhizome art-based selection. He has written for blogs and magazines such as Progetto Grafico and Doppio Zero. Since 2013, he manages the Post-Digital Publishing Archive, PDPA-Net, and his paper is entitled The Post-Digital Publishing Archive, an Inventory of Speculative Strategies. There you go. Hello, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank Yannick Adema, Gary Hall, and Coventry University for giving me the chance to present my current research in such an inspiring context. Today, I'll discuss a recent ongoing project of mine called Post-Digital Publishing Archive, in short PDPA, an online platform to collect projects and artwork at the intersection of publishing and digital technology. I believe that some of PDPA's premises resonate with the issues uh, raised in the seminar. In particular, I'd like to go through some of the elements characterizing the, curator uh, the curatorial practice, such as selection, categorization, dialogue with creators, interface design in order to highlight the way they contribute to what is generally called knowledge production. In doing so, I hope that the specificity of this case study may have a more general value. In the arts and design field, it is essential to look at the combination of strategies employed and desired effects. I often come, come, come across projects with very different assumptions that have almost coincident outcomes, or conversely, very different results that we derive from a similar focus. The articulation of this difference has a strong influence in, on practice as it helps to build methodologies and to overcome the someone already did that feeling. The investigation of publishing in the digital age needs such comparison among different signifying strategies. It should be possible to look simultaneously at physical and digital books, custom tools and proprietary platforms, online networks and offline one, because they exist simultaneously, influencing each other. Although several works embedding this complexity do already exist, it is uh, still hard to build or identify a comprehensive mindset to approach them. Precisely because of their hybrid nature, these works have sometimes little recognition. Additionally, they don't often, often show up as case studies in the publishing field, as they belong to contexts such as new media art, poetry, design, electronic literature, often regarded as unrelated. Post-digital print by Alessandro Ludovico with Afterward by Florian Kramer, opens up the way to such mindset. The, the, uh, the book goes beyond a linear vision of technological process, progress that generally simplifies or even prevents the comparative analysis of different practices. It offers a narrative that connects lo-fi technologies and do-it-yourself approaches, such as mail art, staples in, personal blogs. Between the lines, one can read the obvious assumption, yet enlightening, that contemporary printed uh, matter both derived from and is dependent by digital ecosystems. It embeds uh, the digital process that generated it and it uh, is subsequently dipped in a digitally informed environment. PDPA adopts the post-digital label uh, as an homage to the book. At the same time, it takes advantage of the fluidity of the term, a concept that offers a broad scope. In its original sense, post-digital encapsulated the decline of the revolutionary potential of digital technologies. According to Kim Kanskohn, the mere use of a new technology wasn't enough anymore to make art. By stating that in the year 2000, the world was post-digital, or sort of, he advoca uh, advocated the overcoming of the technological frenzy. In the field of publishing, this frenzy is still very present, as evidenced by frequent, bold, forgetful proclaims. The endless end of the book and the future of the book are two, uh, two sides of the same coin. Probably, this has to do with the fact that digital revolution had a less recognizable effect than in music, for instance. The aesthetic of V-books doesn't help. On various levels, EPUB files resemble early 2000 websites. In this context, it is useful to apply a post-digital perspective to publishing in order to overtake the mandate of commercial innovation and be able to grasp less pompous phenomena. 
like for instance underground e-publishing. To do so, I suppose that a paradigm shift can help. An object-oriented focus should be replaced by, or at least matched, matched with, a system-oriented one. From this perspective, the humble PDF, which is still the lingua franca of book sharing, becomes suddenly cutting edge, despite multimedia book apps. Siegfried Zielinski describes the post-digital attitude as an attempt to build awareness around digitality without precluding it. I think the iPad, this sort of portable white cube, best represents both the ideology and the surface effects of the digital. How is it possible to break the iOS incantation? For sure, it is helpful to, to recollect and compare strategies and operational modes employed by creators that use publishing as a medium in itself and as, as a subject of reflection. P PDPA derives from this need. Through the act of collecting, the post-digital attitude extends from the examined works to the archive itself. The word archive is partially inappropriate because I don't own all the physical artifacts present in a website and the documentation about them is not always comprehensive. Sorry. However, I believe it is a powerful word because it's also a sort of institutional aura. Currently, PDPA includes around 20 works by artists, designers and writers located between Europe and the United States. Of course, one of the main inspiration comes from Ubu Web that can be considered, not surprisingly, a publishing platform. It is shocking to know that this almost 20 years old web website, it, it is still updated by one, one person, the executive manager of words, Kenneth Goldsmith, who does that by writing pure HTML. This do-it-yourself artisanal craft is valuable because it expresses a digital modus vivendi. In PDPA, this artisanality partly lies in a slow-paced updating process. Today, collecting often equals the push of the reblog button on Tumblr. On the contrary, each addition to, the, to PDPA is accompanied by an actual contact with the creator, sometimes followed by an, an interview. In this way, creators get to know each other if they don't do already. As the scope is not to validate the artists, the investigation is targeted toward the speculative strategies and the achieved effect. PDPA's attitude is reflected in, in, design, in its design as well. The mosaic layout fosters a sort of holistic vision, juxtaposition as a declaration of intent. When selecting the works, I see digitality as a form of contextualization rather than an intrinsic feature. Uh, for example, it must be played on, on a computer or it must have been produced by a computer. Computer. Even though this is an unstable and ultimately subjecti subjective criteria, it is more inclusive, also in terms of historical framing. I'd like to provide a few examples to show how this can lead to interesting association. This is the prototype of reading. Oops, sorry, it's this one. Oh. This is the prototype of a reading machine envisioned by Bob Brown, an avant-garde writer acting in the 30s who wanted to read, and I quote, to read 100,000 words novels in 10 minutes. The machine would simply proje project one word at a time at a fast pace. Although it was never built, Brown commissioned text for the machine that were printed in traditional books. This recent project, called Spritz, derives from a, a premise similar to Brown's, to read faster. In the colloquial sense of the term, Bob Brown's machine is not digital, but it is part of the same lineage of such techno te technologies like Spritz, and therefore it can inform the latter. In an article host in PDPA, Abigail Thomas, talking about the texts written for the reading machine, rightly argues that through the materiality of the page acting as the imagined machine, the reader, the reader becomes the machine themselves. A more, a more recent example is James Bridle, My Life in Tweets, made in 2009. Um, the project is rather simple, a collection of every tweet by the artist uh, during two years in book form. The work was able to anticipate and preve pre preventively reflect upon the plethora of companies that soon after would provide a similar service. In order to relate such works, a categorization system that is both flexible and extensible is needed. This task hides many pitfalls and requires various fields of expertise, so what follows is an initial sketch of guidelines. As you can see in the index page, the works included cover several media and therefore demonstrate that books or e-books are not the ineluctable outcome of a reflection around publishing. For instance, Paige Turner, Paige Turner this animated gift by Annette Holland, seems to visualize Kenneth Kelly, uh, Kevin Kelly's utopia in which all the books 
in the world become a single liquid fabric of interconnected words and ideas. SPDPA's main scope is to highlight strategies to replicate them and build upon them. Taking media into account is not sufficient. It is important to list the technologies involved, both the one needed to produce the work and the one needed to reproduce it. This is less easy than it seems. In a spectrum that may go from the alphabetical order to the Raspberry Pi, where do we start or stop? No less important is the role of platform. Here I think of, of the services provided by companies like Google or Amazon. As an example, I'd like to mention a performance a performance by G German artist Johannes P. Osterhoff, who, to comment upon the fact that everything we read on a Kindle is seamlessly sent to Amazon servers, ironically sends this reading information directly to Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos via email. In this case, the work becomes unintelligible without addressing the Kindle ecosystem as a platform. This fussy categorization aims to extend the notion of materiality formulated by Anne Catherine Hales. An extended materiality incorporates the production and distribution processes employed in the work as signifiers, even when they are not apparent, because making them apparent is the goal. Trying to list all the, ne uh, the necessary metadata leads to, this, leads to, to dizziness. A, monol a monolithic set breaks in the, face of, in the face of such fluidity. An accumulative, exposed approach may work better. Instead of overlaying the items with a pre-built view, it would allow to ask, uh, to ask questions over the resulting categorization. Based on RDFA, the proof of concept adopted mixes a few common ontologies such as Dublin Core and Forth with a custom one. I agree with Yannick Adema when she argues that there is a felt need to emphasize how the media mat materiality or specific format influences its meaning and use. This need should inform categorization. Materiality as the physical outcome or the final representation of a work is not enough. A motto to highlight the performative uh, aspects of materiality could be, in this specific context, if it's on arg.org, it's not the same book. Talking about books, I interpret the aesthetic of bookishness as the material acknowledgement of the influence of digital networks on them. The above publication could be an example, a unique case in which the graphic design of the book epitomizes its production and distribution processes. These processes result in, in different versions of the, of the book, four in total. In the designer's words, the graded value of distribution and materiality are stated on checkboxes on the cover, where it becomes apparent that they exist as figures separated from the unknown value of content production. The aesthetic of bookishness is also reflected uh, in the distinctive physicality echoing Xeroxid zines of print-on-demand books made via Lulu, and you can see some examples here. The above blank books, made by Giulia Ciliberto in collaboration with me, resulted from the use of criteria which are specific to the platform employed, Lulu, such as the, m the minimum and maximum uh, available size, amount of pages, price. In fact, you can buy the tome on the left for one million euro. At this point, uh, it is fair to ask, uh, what, do we, what do we mean by publishing? A side effect of this just a position of works and multiple materialities is an, an extension, for better or worse, of the notion of publishing itself. Let's consider, for instance, DNA Apparel, an online service created by Daniel Luxemburg in 2013 that allows a user to print part of her genome on a custom T-shirt. Let's now compare it with the following principle stated by Andrew Murphy in 2008. And I will read it because I like it. Publishing should be defined as broadly as possible, almost to the boundaries of life and culture. Consider the publication, uh, the publication of genomic material or by increasingly sophisticated brain scanners of the electrochemical ac activity of the brain. I'd like to conclude with this definition. Thanks for the attention. How do you view, say, the works of William Burroughs, the cut-ups? And, and also, when you say, say stochastic, to what extent do you mean random? Right. Um, well, cut-up works. I, I'm going to have to turn my, my sound down just a little because it's echoing here. Um, so cut-up works, I think, point to some things that Silvio 
and it is touching on as well, um, which have to do with the kind of fluid condition of texts, right? I mean, you know, all of the, all texts are composed out of fragments and snatches of language that are reconfigured, um, and often sort of terrify my students by letting them know that every word they speak has already passed through, you know, thousands of other mouths, right? It's like, you know, it's like we don't invent language; we invent the the configurations of it. So, you know, Burroughs demonstrates the, you know, kind of uh, condition of fluidity by, um, you know, taking his language from extant uh, materials, his own in many cases, and, and, and reconfiguring them. Um, and, uh, but, you know, poets do that all the time. I mean, writers do it constantly. He just, I think, made explicit what some of those procedures are. Um, random and, and uh, nonlinear are not the same. Um, random processes, there's a certain randomness within stochastic processes, but they're not random because the, they're, the conditions are actually um, highly structured and set. Um, but then there's um, a certain amount of um, unpredictability that is random. Um, again, natural processes, weather is the best example of a stochastic process. And actually a lot of work on stochastic processes came from meteorology. Um, and it's just, you know, there's a, uh, there's a degree of, of variation and um, that has to do with the, um, you know, the complexity of the system and what emerges within it. Um, but the but it's not completely random. In, in other words, there are structuring principles and conditions um, that uh, we can observe. Hi. Uh, yeah, this is working. Uh, thanks again, both for such great stimulating talks. I don't think we'll be able to address all the issues that have been raised. Um, uh, I'd like to start by, Silvio, can you go back to your last but one slide where you're using the quote from Ma Andrew Murthy, yeah, and that's saying that publishing uh, almost to the boundaries of life and culture, I'm kind of interested in the almost and why it doesn't <laughs> go that little bit further. Um, and that would be one of the reasons uh, why I guess we would be interested not just in the post-digital, but something that you might think of as post-human or post-humanities. And it's kind of why we chose the name Disrupting Humanities rather than, I don't know, something like Digital Humanities or whatever those uh, issues are. And then if we we'll go from there back to Joanna's start where she talked about wanting to rethink uh, human and modernity and uh, aesthetics as well as that. And um, I suppose part of my question uh, goes to Joanna's concept of performative ma materiality. And so we have um, the material and that provokes the performance. And I suppose my question when I've been reading that material is I'm kind of always unsure whether the performance itself is is material. Is it part of the same ontology or is it is it different? Is it is it something is the human standing different from that? Um, it just gets to a larger question, are text fluid and are we fluid as well, or are we somehow more stable? Hello, anyone hear that? I think, <laughs> Joanna? Please don't make me repeat this. <laughs> well, Sylvia, you can start if you want. I oh, mean. Well, uh, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, well, I can see, say something maybe uh, about this relationship, according to me at least, um, between uh, the performance itself and the materiality, I see the fact that um, there is a risk in hiding uh, the, the, the performative aspects. It's a bit what Soren as well was saying, the, the performative aspects of interface. So um, when, when, when I say that uh, uh, if it's not on ARC, it's, it's not, uh, if it's on ARC, it's not the same book, I, I try to um, to create a look in which you can consider those aspects, both from a perspective of a practitioner in the way you build your own uh, informational objects, artifacts, but at the same time from a perspective of a curator of, of, or of a researcher in, uh, in the matter of specifying this, uh, this performative aspects and to join them, because I have the feeling that they are still separated. Uh, they, they are uh, sort of hidden sometimes from the final object. Well, that's partly what I was pushing towards. Is it seems to be there's this human curator, and it's kind of standing apart from that. And yet, what you're saying there is publishing is almost pushing to the boundaries of 
life and culture. And I'm, I'm wondering what it does for that notion of this auto autonomous human subject that's kind of standing out of there, which I'm guessing in a lot of the theory that you're working with, you kind of wouldn't be quite so happy with. And yet, when it comes, and we all do this, when it comes to our practices, and, you know, tactical media does this, you kind of, it's this autonomous human person that's making these de decisions and choices as to say, um, and Aaron would have talked about it in terms of cuts, is to try and to say, well, this is how I'm going to intervene, and I'm, I'm going to try and, you know, do something here. But I'm wondering how much that falls into a very humanist, liberal notion of the subject that we kind of might not be so happy with. So the problem is with auto autonomy, you think? Yes. Or the notion of an autonomous human that uh, publishing is almost rethinking, but we're going to just pull back. It's like Althusser's last instance, isn't it? It's kind of, <laughs> well, we're almost going there, and then we're going to pull back from that. Joanna? Yes, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just in here um, and say, you know, I think that um, uh, what, what we're looking for here, I think, is the kind of um, uh, shift in understanding that comes in the work of, of some of the people that I think of as associated with new materialisms. Um, I don't know if you know the work of Diana, uh, uh, Diana Cool and Samantha Frost and Karen Barad um, and others, but you know, it picks up on things that, you know, Deleuze has talked about for a long time as well. But um, what it allows us to do, I think, is to think in terms of conditionality um, rather than autonomy. Um, and, I, and I've been trying to push this notion of the conditional text rather than the fluid text. Um, though I'm happy with the fluid text, I think it um, doesn't take fully into account the way in which um, works, events, experiences, individuals are constituted conditionally. In other words, we are conditionally configured. Um, and so there's a lot of contingencies and codependencies in the way in which the boundaries that give us this sense of autonomy actually exist. So we have a kind of, you know, Lacanian illusion of, of autonomy, right? It's like the, the, the concept of the other is the story the subject tells to itself in order to believe that it has a self. Um, but the, the story um, is always a process. It always has to do with these transactional relationships between that constituting subject and the conditions in which the subject constitutes itself. So these are ongoing processes. So there's no sort of, you know, stable, single bounded entity that is the self. Um, there's instead a whole, you know, ongoing set of, of processes, conditions, dependencies. And the same can be said of the way in which texts exist. I mean, I think, you know, Silvio's, um, you know, discussion points this out as well when he's talking about, um, you know, the Kindle. It's like when you read a text on a Kindle, you're not reading a text that is a standalone thing. It's a text that's produced in a whole set of relationships with platforms, bandwidth, communication cycles, display capacities, all of these things. Um, and I think that's the reason why I've been so keen to, to move away from the kind of approach to materiality that is rooted in, I mean, I love Matt Kirschenbaum, but the forensic and the formal materialities, like those of Kate Hales, are too literal. In other words, they have this kind of sense that there's a materiality to the artifact that explains and uh, is sufficient to account for its interpretive capacity, its capacity to provoke interpretation. So I'll finish in a second, but I would just suggest that not only is the book that's on a Kindle and an iPad and a screen not the same book, but every time you pick a book up to read it, it's not the same book. And, and that's something that Jerome McGann was so insistent on, and D.F. McKenzie and other people in critical bibliography to demonstrate how the production of a text is situated within its social conditions as well. I mean, the great Treaty of Waitangi essay by D.F. McKenzie, which is just, you know, sort of filled with cultural parallax um, around a particular very important diplomatic text, was a demonstration of that, that the text is not a singularity, even if it's one artifact. It is a multiplicity of possibilities constituted by the reader's engagements, um, and often to greatly contradictory um, kinds of ends. I'm sorry that was such a long answer, but um, yeah. <laughs> that was great, thank you. 
Any other questions, officers, or comments? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm. I w I'm. I'm curious. Uh, uh, in uh, Joanna's, uh, in 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 your talk, how do you relate this kind of diagrammatic, uh, this notion of the diagrammatic, that that you develop? Maybe you kind of answered it before, but but how do you relate that to, to the your the stuff you've been doing on on interfaces? Because, you know, for for one thing, you could say, well, the diagrammatic points towards, you know, uh, other dimensions of reading, spatial, uh, et cetera, as you talked about them. But it's also, if you talk about interfaces, it's, uh, you know, it, it also becomes a performance or a behavior that can be mapped and, and monitored and is mapped and monitored. And, and, well, you know, you talk about relational databases brought that up. I think, uh, at least in my mind, because they are basically ways of 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 monitoring, uh, um, uh, um, uh, yeah, relations, um, and and uh, y to sort of put that on also to uh, relate that to what Sylvia was talking about. I, I was curious, you know, how you you map all these uh, projects, but why are they coming now, or is it just now you're mapping it, or I is there something that makes all this stuff happen? Right now, you know, you talk about the post digital. How, how would you, how would you localize this, sort of in relation to, to what else, to, to what goes on? I would say that. Uh, well, I, I can talk for my context of origin. So I, um, I can see all these projects as a sort of uh, reference tool, especially in contexts such as uh, design university. I have the feeling that bringing these strategies in the, in the field uh, of uh, design schools can be extremely useful to understand how um, information can be managed and what can be um, actually done, which is not just, uh, let's, let's say I will make a basic example to um, adding layer, layers of uh, multimediality to a digital artifact. So I, I, I try to do so in order to go over that, to, to list all this and try to, 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 bring, to bring them together because I think that they can talk each other. By now, they are, they are not. So I, I think it's useful in this context as reference to be replicated. So this, this is my, my way to localize it. I, I know I have, uh, it's clear that uh, there is a risk in uh, sort of uh, diluting um, origins of co or context, uh, but at the same time, it's a uh, it's a way to create a path that w is not there yet. I think, or at least uh, as far as I know. Yes, yeah, Sylvia. I think you know. Um, it's interesting to think about your, um, you know, all of these examples that you've that you've pulled into focus here, because I think they do indicate, in a way, a kind of um, maturation phase. In, the, in, in our relationship to um, digital technology that, you know, when you look back and think about the hyperbolic rhetoric of, you know, Michael Heim and electric language or, you know, the um, early days of hypertext and so forth. And it was this incredible kind of utopian, brave new, you know, literary form and so forth. Well, it turns out, you know, that has become our habit of, of work. It's our daily business. Um, and so in a sense, there's a kind of, you know, letting go of that euphoria and hyperbolic exaggeration. But I think there's also a kind of, you know, greater attention to how do these things actually work? You know, what, how do we, how do we get, um, you know, you're talking about, you know, teaching in a design context. How do you sensitize um, students to that which is so familiar that they often don't see how it works? Um, and here again, I'd go back to the, the question about interface, that interface is so complicated and so relational um, that again, think about the language for understanding how it works is a really useful, critical tool. It's a, you know, um, we need a kind of, you know, wonderful Roland Barth type rhetoric of the interface essay um, at this point um, to think about it. Um, you know, and I guess the other thing I would just say is that you know, the monitoring issue is a, an interesting one. You can, you can do a brain scan of somebody reading a book, but the brain scan information is so 
much cruder than what the processing in that person's brain is. I mean, we have a long, long way to go before, you know, the kind of eye scans and eye tracking really tell us anything about the act of reading. They tell us where people look on a page, but they don't tell us very much about, about interpretation or acts of interpretation. I mean, there's things we can say about it. It's not that they're not useful tools, but they're crude by contrast to the actual act of reading, um, you know, and what goes on in, the, in cognition. I think, but yeah. Can I comment on that quickly? Because I'm just wondering also, Joanna, what you were talking about in your talk about forms of diagrammatics kind of replacing in that sense or kind of favoring that instead of ideogrammatic forms. Uh, I'm just wondering if we need some kind of diagrammatic literacy for the digital age in that sense, because we're quite used maybe to, for instance, the interface of the book. Uh, but you can in a way say that maybe diagrams are harder to process for a lot of people than pictures and visualizations, although they of course sometimes also have their diagrammatic effects. And this also kind of relates to this idea of, of, of interface critique, yeah, that people are not always aware of how interfaces work and what's behind them, what's behind uh, you know, what is the code behind the things that we, and the same thing with reading these kind of, uh, the, you see that a lot also with the example with the ink after print that a lot of people found it, the first thing that somebody said I think was, uh, it was hard, it was hard to understand, you know, and is there something that we should really try and, and develop a pedagogy towards understanding the layers behind this more, if that makes any sense? Yes. <laughs> I would say absolutely. I mean, I, I, I do think we need a pedagogy um, of, uh, you know, of knowledge for knowledge design and knowledge production. Um, and, and by knowledge production, knowledge design, I, I'm not excluding poetics um, by any means. I mean, I think, you know, rhetoric, poetics, the structures of argument, these are these are things that, you know, we we can usefully recover in, in, um, in thinking about how we uh, design a pedagogy. Um, that's, uh, you know, sort of meets the, the potentials uh, for the possibilities of our time. So I'm, I'm all in favor. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, I just published a new book <laughs> called Graphesis that's just out from Harvard about visual forms of knowledge production. Um, and uh, though it, it doesn't go far enough, um, you know, it's sort of like, okay, yeah, that's like everything I used to know, and now there's like all the things I want to say now, but um, <laughs> so the problem with books. But, um, you know, in a way, I'm trying to grope towards what I call a non-representational approach to visual, visual forms of knowledge production, and that sounds contradictory, except that by saying non-representational, all I'm trying to suggest is that the visual and graphic function as primary objects, not as secondary presentations of something already known, that they're primary. They're the site of knowledge production, not the representation of something already known. Thank you. And would you I don't know if that makes sense, but. And uh, Sylvia, would you agree that maybe in design also we need more? Diagram? Yeah, did this raise uh, curiosity? I, I would like to know, Joanna, maybe your position on what is so the so-called infostatics do you think there is some risks in the, uh, in the uh, let's say, the popularization of such tools? You showed Mare as a negative example, uh, uh, not negative, I mean, as a rep representational uh, yeah. example. So I'm wondering what's, why did you choose that? Sure, I can read you a whole paper I've been working on on the fallacies of information visualization. You know, because again, to, in my mind, most information visualizations are reifications of misinformation, and they are representations that are passing themselves off as presentations. They appear to be what is, and they are elaborate constructs, as, as all of us know who work in design. Um, they're rhetorical arguments. They're not presentations of fact. So again, um, the, this, there are theoretical implications um, from which we can develop that argument, but there's also just common sense ones um, that, we, that we can see very readily in terms of how the, the, the reification of misinformation works in information visualization. So, you know, I teach it and I also critique it. You know, so, um, but I try to teach the critique alongside of the techniques. Want to say more on that or no? no? All right. Other questions or comments? Uh, um, I'm, I'm just thinking of uh, 
a marriage between the traditional way of um, art production or execution and uh, the digital aspect. You know, it seems to me that um, one has been almost uh, neglected or left out, while the other one that is or uh, emerging or that is now the in thing is being, um, you know, blown into uh, opening that uh, we know about. So, uh, what do we? Th what is the? How are we going to approach the synthesis between the two? Is there any way the two can come together so that they can? Be better, you know. Generally, that's just I don't know. I mean, the Does two it parameters. the two the, the traditional way of um, you know art um, art execution and the production and the digital the the the, um, the world we are now, which is the digital world, you know. How do we see the two coming together, you know, so that it could the two could be better in marriage? I don't know whether my question is uh, clear. The traditional way of uh, doing things, not neglecting it, why at the same time, um, of course, uh, you know, being realistic with what is happening in thing now. That's my question. There are some opportunities uh, in this sense for uh, designers. So I, uh, uh, I have to start saying that I don't see uh, so, a, such, such a clear boundary between uh, traditional way of making design and a digital one. Uh, but um, considering the fact that uh, tools uh, are uh, uh, traditional, uh, de designers, uh, tools that are uh, made for designers, also let's say desktop publishing tools are now avail available for everyone, maybe a uh, designer can take a step uh, further, maybe, and um, let's say, uh, scale their role in, in the production of tools. So they can, uh, especially in protected space, such as university, they could start to question the tools they use. And I think this is still not very common in university. For, for sure, it's not in mine. Um, we had like a course uh, called contemporary publishing, and the tool used uh, to, to do so was um, is a tool called uh, Adobe Digital su su Suite. It's a sort of extended uh, Adobe InDesign for uh, for iPad, basically that allows to add uh, videos and interactivity. Um, but no, for for instance, no skill in EPUB was uh, EPUB the open standard for eBooks was uh, provided. So uh, the risk is that in five years those students. Uh, won't, uh, won't find a job because the, the, this tool will be obsolete, while uh, the other possibilities more open uh, were not taken in consideration, which, which is an actual skill, the one of VPUB, for instance. So uh, I think there should be more attention to, um, to the implication of the tools used. And this is an opportunity for designers while studying designer, uh, while, uh, while studying design, of course. I would agree, Silvio. I think that's very wise. And I think, you know, I would even suggest that some of the traditional skills that we that we uh, used to teach that have to do with handwork, um, learning to draw, learning to sketch, learning to think visually um, in a very direct way, um, working with clay, wood, materials. I mean, I think these are all things that produce forms of knowledge that are useful for design, um, you know, and, and thinking spatially, how you understand a space, um, because a, digital, a virtual space is also a series of encounters that, that we could actually, um, you know, reintegrate some of the kind of old foundation exercises that we used to do into um, our classes and see where that goes. I, I'm particularly um, uh, fond of teaching people to draw because I think it gives them a language they don't have otherwise, um, and that's different from the drawing that you do on the screen. I mean, it has an immediacy to it. So um, I, I, I think it's good for us to keep thinking about what we want to bring forward from our uh, more traditional training into the future uh, training of our, of, of, of our next generation. Can I add to that, for instance, it would be good if we would do that in an ongoing manner where I am a very good example of somebody who can't even write their own signature anymore because I don't write anymore. So this is 
a skill that we seem to be losing, things as simple as handwriting. Um, any other questions? Yeah? This is one. Them are complementary. We cannot, uh, as you said, uh, neglect one and uh, and only. Uh well, there is also a reality. I mean, the reality that you have to choose some sort of uh, curricula or uh, in school. So you have to make some choices. Of course, that would be great to uh, bring together all this. But I'm I'm not sure how much. For, for example. Uh, I, I don't know if there is enough space both for hand drawing in a, in a three years design uh, program and uh, of, uh, let's say, illustrator software or illustration in general. I would like that that, sh that would be like that, but I, I'm not sure if all of this is possible. So I think uh, in this sense, what I might say is that I think more uh, independent, um, yeah, autonom autonom uh, autonomy should be provided to uh, to the path to the students in order to choose uh, to choose their path. I don't know how it works here in this sense. Maybe uh, there is already. Uh, I think yeah, th this is crucial in a way. I think it's also important to then again what you said emphasize the fact that within university settings at least there is all this proprietary software that we're using with and we're only using students to use this specific program like Adobe or Dreamweaver or and so there's not much kind of experimentation beyond the kind of programs uh, software suits that a university is subscribed to which is of course practical and uh, but these are the structures that we kind of educate people within and this kind of ignores the fact that there's all these interesting open source software tools for instance which are for instance much more used within kind of alternative uh, university institutions outside of the university in that sense. Uh, so there's an interesting divide in between educating people within a certain view of design. This is the way you make something and I wonder how generic that also makes students in that sense. So. Maybe that there is the opposite risk, so to impose open source or alternative tools. Well, not even to oppose them, but yeah. you know, to have like a choice at least in between. Um, but I, I think already seeing the tool it, it would be great to, to co say something about it in the moment you use it, not just uh, uh, yeah, as, 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 uh, assume that you would use Photoshop or whatever. Yeah, I think we have to be very sen sensitive to the ways in which pedagogical practices um, imprint certain kinds of constructs about what's possible into into people's minds. Um, again, you think about you know if you're raised um, you know w w to believe that you know you you mustn't move your body in a certain way, um, that you mustn't dance or that you mustn't sing or you mustn't raise your voice over a certain level, then, you know, that becomes a prohibition to development. Um, you know, if you teach people, you know, language by only teaching them how to read instruction manuals, then, you know, they don't have an understanding of what, you know, poetry and, and fiction and imaginative works bring to the human experience. So, you know, I think we have, um, you know, we have a, a, a very important charge as teachers to expose students to a wide range of, of possibilities for the ways in which their own thought can develop. That's all. Um, while understanding, of course, there are these realities within, within the constraints of curricula and so forth. Um, you know, it's like there's still room to teach people to draw. You know, I teach people to draw in a couple of days. You you just have them draw in class. It's 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 amazing how quickly you can you can transfer certain kinds of skills um, to students. They don't all have to be able to render an apple in a perfectly illusional way. Um, you know, so so I think it's there's there's some balance. You know that we can that we can work with. A question down the back. Um, this is regarding what you mentioned, uh, Silvio, that um, the reader becomes the machine himself. I found it as a very pertinent statement because um, when we look at uh, digital media or even the news channels and when they show um, a lot of breaking news and the certain kind of news that they present every single time. So I just personally feel that we become classically conditioned to see something negative as a breaking news. I mean, puts in my thought that why can't we see something positive as a breaking news rather than 
you know, just hearing about the killings and the bombings or something. I know it doesn't, it, it's not very direct to what you were mentioning, but uh, that was one of the thought that came in my head because um, from the culture where I come from, uh, breaking news is like, um, if I look at it at an average, after every five minutes, there's a breaking news on the channel. So I just wanted to add that. I just need to add that uh, the quote was by Abigail Thomas about this machine. It wasn't mine, so she, she will be happy to uh, hear, I guess. I just want to make a suggestion that, um, you know, the traditional way of uh, art uh, production and the, the new digital age, uh, none of them should actually be, um, uh, be taken away, you know. Uh, rather, they should... Um, be fused in a way, you know, in, in such a way that um, we won't forget our past. At the same time, we will move forward. We won't stay, you know, just at the point of the traditional way of making art. At the same time, you know, we move forward. And I think that has really been a challenge. You know, I read a place in the, the Holy Book, the, the Bible talks about, you know, some people asking whether they should pay tight or not and all that, you know. And Jesus said that, well, some people pay on anion and cornmeal, which is a uh, plant, and, uh, you know, and neglected some matters like a law justice. Hey, but the two should actually go together. Don't neglect the payment of, uh, you know, the title. And uh, of course, the law justice and the whole thing should also go side by side. In the, in the same way, I want to advocate that um, any teacher of art or, you know, the pedagogy, it should be entrenched that people should know at least a little bit of their past, which is a traditional way of doing things, you know, and of course, uh, the digital, digital reality should also be pursued vigorously. Thank you. Okay, so I think before we start wrapping up, would you like to say something to, as a kind of ending, feel free, you don't Me? have to if you <laughs> want to, and I'll ask uh, Joanna the same. Is there anything you'd like to respond to in the end? Or? Uh, I would like to thank you okay. for thank <laughs> being you. here. Yeah, me too. Uh, thank it was you a honor. Very much. Thank you, and well, thank both of you, and Sarah and Alan. Yeah, it's great having you here.